Okay, so the second half, I will talk about transverse structure, so transverse theories. So how many of you already knew everything about the distribution function and uh, know already everything about transverse theory? How many of you already know what transverse theory is? One, okay. You can raise your hand also in this time. Yeah. I'm just curious if what I, Told you before was already like well known or not, and this is already well known. But okay, I guess it's uh, fairly new. So I um, okay. So transversity, yeah. So we uh, go back to our uh, handy little chart of our. Um, this is actually work. Uh, it's too far down here. Uh, no, I don't see. Just well, the, uh, uh, this is probably it's pretty good. So yeah. This is awesome. Yeah, so we can get it. No, no okay, I just go over here. Okay. So, in any case, so we um, uh, go again back to our chart of our uh, chart of our uh, power distribution functions, um, which are you know categorized according to the current border polarization, walk polarization, the leading twist. So, if we look at part of distributions. Uh, uh, and in the preliminary picture, so not the D set, we have these three guys. Um, so we already discussed not true at length, when we have unpolarized and polarized, that's so one left, the so called transverse distribution function. So here we'll see in the pattern model, those are the difference between transversely polarized quarks and the transversely polarized nuclear minus the same, but with a flipped quark polarization. So, um, as we mentioned yesterday, so you at first uh, look can say, hey, that's basically the same as this. Why is this an independent distribution function? But you forget that we are sitting in this highly boosted frame where we look at the quarks on the light bulb. So, since boost and rotations don't commute, these are completely independent distributions. And if you listen to talks of the similars or so on, you find all kinds of Interpretations, uh, you know, well, what this difference tells you, but um, which I can't really repeat here. Um, so, the point I want to make though is why transversity for the longest time was the least, or it still is, in principle, the least well known PDF is that you cannot access it in, in uh, TIS, so in inclusive, even as scattering. So, we showed this uh, structure before for the polarized scattering. And you see that the, anything that has remotely to do with transverse, namely this GT, is here at a subleading twist. So this is not a transversity, but transversity in a leading twist function. Um, so transversity is not accessible in, in inclusive DIS. So the first question is why is that? And there are different ways of, of uh, understanding this. Um, so what you usually uh, see people saying is, uh, okay, people say, okay, it's a chiral odd distribution. So what does it mean? Or why does it make it difficult to measure? So chiral odd means that if I look at transversity in the transversity base, as I said, I, I have this uh, probabilistic interpretation as the probability of finding a transversely polarized quark that is, has the same direction as the transversely polarized chiral nuclear minus the one where the quark carries the opposite transverse polarization. If I go back in the helicity base, and you remember that this diagram is what we had in the very beginning as expansion of our end back amplitudes. We actually had this diagram and we went to the transversity base to get the photonic interpretation. But if you go back to the helicity base and write out this transverse spin state in terms of this key states, you get this hand back diagram here on the right side where you have a photon in, in one helicity state, you take out a quark, and that quark has to flip this. Um, List here across the handle here, go back in the photon. And uh, from the optical theory, we know that the cross sections are proportional to those forward scattering amplitudes. And um, at high energies, um, these spin flips here are highly suppressed. You know, so they um, are uh, um, suppressed with the, essentially with the quark mass here. You know? So if the quark doesn't have any mass, let's say it was a neutrino, it's not allowed to flip it at all. Uh, because of its mass, it is allowed to, but it is basically suppressed with the quark mass. Okay, 
So this heavily suppressed NQCD, which was one reason why people in the beginning thought the transverse uh, correlation effects are, are very small. So, but this um, has uh, also another, uh, looking at this diagram, you also get another feature of transversity, namely that at least, um, you know, at uh, first order, there's no transversity for rules. So why is that? If you look at this, I mean, the spin flip here, so gluon is spin one, okay? So if I flip the spin of the gluon and pull it back to the photon, I have to flip the spin coordinate by two, yeah? But I can't do that to my photon because the photon spin on half can't accomplish this. So the nice thing in terms of like a theory treatment is that uh, transversity therefore is like a balance for property. You know? So I can't have it to the gluons. So that my gluons can also not give it to my uh, seed balls you know, with this, you know, there's, um, Couple caveats to that, but like to first to first uh, approximation, this is like a uh, balance for property, and this makes it very attractive uh, for for um, theory comparison because, uh, as you remember, because these part of the distribution functions are defined in the light form, it cannot directly compare them to lattice calculations, which are operating in Euclidean time. So I have to, what I can compare though are moments. The problem is if I measure PDFs and try to do a moment, as you saw from data G, it's difficult. For say helicity, because I have to go down to x of zero, which I can't really measure. So here, the valence for property, uh, property, I'm dominated by uh, the valence region, so I can actually have hope to measure the whole integral compared to uh, first order calculation. And then, uh, for reasons that I'm also not qualified to uh, explain uh, fully, it turns out that uh, this is actually a fairly easy thing to calculate with lattice. So it has uh, small uh, systematic facts, which has to do with the the setup on the performance of the lattice. So it's one of those uh, rare opportunities where we have a spin-dependent property of the proton that you can calculate to a very high precision on the lattice and you can compare the experiments. So that's like one interesting part of transversity. Tensor charge integral is, is a very interesting property. The other thing that had recently also attracted some, um, some um, uh, attention is that if you have uh, new physics that uh, couples as a tensor coupling to the proton for whatever reason. Um, that will then also, if you, if you couple to the whole proton in some sense, so not like in a, a high energy process, of, but in, at, at lower energies, uh, that um, coupling strength also goes with the tensor charge. So you can, this goes in into uh, new physics limits uh, contributing to the nuclear beta decay uh, or neutron DDM and so on. So that's also an uh, interesting part of. of Okay, so I hope this kind of motivates you that it's uh, independent. Of course, this already tells you that um, that the transversity is one of the three um, kind of like, you know, if you expand the nuclear structure to first order needing twist, uh, transversity is needed to describe the, the spin structure of the nucleon in a kind of an abstract way, but in a very practical way, uh, there's a lot of theory interest to in particular extract the tensor charge. Uh, in addition to, to measuring uh, transversity. Okay, so how do we measure transversity? Um, so uh, first, A, why, why is it significant? So as I said, the naive thing is, okay, it's paradox. So what does it mean in practice? So the other argument you can, you make, you can make is again connected to um, this uh, infinite momentum frame where we probe the nuclear structure. So if you go to kind of a semi-classical picture and you ask what does it mean if you call this transversity polarized? So it means that you have a charge that kind of like goes around here, you know? So uh, because if you do EIS, what you in effect are doing, you're, you're coupling to this like magnetic moment of, of, of the quark here, you know? So in a semi-classical picture, it just comes from like an orbital angle of momentum or something like this. So now if you boost this in, uh, you know, an infinite momentum frame, what happens is that, uh, you know, this radius of this circle here kind of becomes, you know, like um, or the, the area that it covers becomes squished, becomes zero. So make moment that you can couple to become zero, so you basically don't see it. So if you look at the um, naive expressions, um, it's basically if you just write down the cross section, the similar argument you make is that the all transverse spin effect they get suppressed once you boost in the infinite momentum frame. But this is kind of like the, the idea why that happens. Uh, so basically, your your um, you know it's your the transverse correlation becomes transparent. You can't see it if you are moving so fast. 
Okay, so how do you measure it then? So instead of um, looking at the dependence of your cross section, you may have to measure the fork polarization directly uh, with a fork polarometer. So you have to have something that is sensitive to the fork transverse, pol uh, transverse fork polarization, which for us means it's a polarization uh, dependent competition function. So how does that work? So we go back to our uh, pen back picture. So, um, and what we basically need it's a fermentation function. So this is a single hammer fermentation function. It's a coins fermentation function. But the job of my fermentation function is to take the quark, the specific elicit state, and basically flip it back here. You know? And how can it do this? So the fermentation function has advantage of testing more legs here, which can, can carry away this additional angular momentum that it has is kind of left over because I flipped the quark polarization. Uh, and it can generate, if I have unpolarized quarks there, can generate uh, a left right asymmetry, which is called the Connors effect. So, as a smart physicist, of course, you can think of other ways. You can produce a polarized uh, hadron sphere, which also exists. You can do lambda production, it's just like more difficult to use. We usually see how applying to the experiments is where we look for those. Uh, and then the other thing I can do, which uh, I personally is one of my favorite areas, you can uh, do uh, dihedral production here. Um, and so you have relative angular momentum in this dihedron uh, system, which also allows you to carry away over angular momentum. Looking for dihedron uh, uh, provides additional insights into um, uh, the hadronizations, uh, 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 hadronization um, mechanisms, and it also has more degrees of freedom, so you can uh, access the nuclear structure in a more precise way. So it's usually called for reasons. The interference fermentation function. So, um, as you see, everything has to do with transverse spin, it's always interference. So, it's kind of like a misnomer, but because you have this interference between these different relative ways, people start to look at this way. And that doesn't really make too much sense. So, it's for example coming here from the interference of the role with a non reason defined fraction. Okay, yeah, so that's what I was saying. So, the, the advantage for the, for the dye head on production is that you have uh, more degrees of freedom because you have two head ons and we see. Hey, that would be uh, excess higher twist um, distribution function. So that we have many more. Uh, this additional degrees of freedom would help us to have less uh, entanglement of our effects. Um, and uh, in this uh, in this um, uh, case here of transversity, uh, the advantage is that um, the um, effect persists if I integrate all the intrinsic transverse momentum. So as you saw here, it's also often that, like a confusion that people have. Uh, the transversity is a collinear PDF. You know? So often people call it TMD, it's not true, it's not TMD. It's a collinear PDF on the same footing as F and G. Uh, so if you couple it with Collins, and we see it later on, here you need intrinsic transverse momentum in the fermentation to generate that right uh, asymmetry. You know? So you kind of couple a TMD with a PDF, which is a little bit dirty, so this way you have to take the whole TMD structure with you. If you take the IFF, you have a collinear fermentation function here that's coupled to a collinear PF, so the whole cross section can be a relative collinear picture, which has, which has advantages. Okay, so uh, so how does it uh, work? Um, uh, so this is maybe kind of like the handbag, the amplitude level. So it's kind of how it works on the amplitude level. That maybe doesn't really give you an intuitive picture how it works like in real life in your experiment. So um, this kind of is like foreshadowing if you have time for that, uh, for the analyzation discussion. Um, so a popular model, how this left-right asymmetry happens kind of in a, in a, a quark model is uh, illustrated by this uh, R2 fermentation um, uh, model. So the idea is that you, um, so DRS is, is insensitive to transverse polarization to the quark, so the cross section is sensitive to that. So it has to come from the fermentation function. And the, the way it, it does it, uh, in this case is you knock out the quark that has a certain um, transverse polarization. You know? So the quark here uh, is um, polarized here down you know, um, in this case. So what happens now that you have a string fermentation um, and we go more a little more in detail, but the point is that uh, the QCD string then uh, generates a quark antiquark pair out of the vacuum. And now what comes in here is uh, that the vacuum actually has quantum numbers. So actually uh, uh, has L equals one, um, S minus one quantum numbers. So if you generate a P2 bar pair, so this guy is gonna be, um, have correlated spins here. 
Uh, so what happens is that it, then if you have a DD bar pair, you can uh, grab the D, the D bar and combine with the U, uh, produce your uh, pi plus. Uh, and so that picks up this L equals one to compensate for the S minus one. Um, and um, while it goes into one direction, well, it's, I'm not sure why. Okay, so it goes in one direction. And then uh, the same thing happens. So you have making this left over uh, D corp here, and Baker does the same thing again, and you uh, produce another pi and goes in that direction. So essentially, what this model uh, uh, on the core level explains is uh, why you get this left right asymmetry in the coins. The fact is Baker just measuring one of these hadrons from the one side, where it says the I hadron fermentation function is measuring the relative momentum between the two. So these hadrons have a relative formula written to each other. So the experiment, what does it mean? How, you, how do you measure this? Um, so you have a transversely polarized uh, quark that goes out and for the Collins effect, and you measure um, the azimuthal angle of that hadron um, around uh, the virtual, or you can say around the direction of the, of the quark. Um, you know, uh, in, with respect to the scattering plane and then the, um, the Collins commutation functions is then uh, encoding the strength of the correlation of this as uh, modulation with the quark uh, transverse polarization. So it basically gives you the amplitude of this sine phi h uh, modulation we specifically um, get here. Does that make sense? So, well, see, tomorrow, of course, you have to measure that at some point. You know? So, uh, in a, by experiment, they can measure this modulation, but it will be. A product of the transversity, which gives me the probability of finding a quark in this transverse field state, times the strength of this, um, you know, correlation to this uh, as a model modulation, which is encoded by the commutation function, which I actually measure in the chemical okay. uh, For the dihedral fermentation function, it's exactly the same thing. I just measure this as a angle of the difference vector between the pi plus and pi minus, and um, I have to measure this dihedral fermentation function somewhere else. Okay, so um, th so this is how I can measure um, um, uh, I can measure um, uh, transversity directly, um, maybe using the Collins fermentation function or any carry out fermentation function. So dihedron transversely polarized lambdas as a core parameter, um, and I can measure the symmetry. So this has been done by the Hermes and Compass experiments, but also by, by class experiments. So here I show a plot by compass, it also compares it with Hermes. So this shows you this asymmetry. So it's basically the um, asymmetrical modulation of the hadron. Um, so it's a kind of an experience. So I have my virtual photon defining the z-axis. I have the transverse polarization of the um, of the proton. Um, I uh, I'm, I'm in this uh, brick frame, the incoming and outgoing electron defines the scattering. Uh, plane and I measure as mutual angles uh, of this hadron plane with respect to the scattering plane. And then uh, the Collins uh, effect is then um, uh, modulation phi h plus uh, phi s here. If you compare to here, you see uh, a sign. Uh, the reason will become clear in a second where it became a cosine here for phi h plus, plus phi s. Uh, but anyway, so the relative contribution of this modulation is then measured by flipping the transverse spin here um, and basically doing the difference, uh, which then gets rid of the unpolarized part again, which basically insulates this modulation and this asymmetry that can measure, you see it reaches up to 5% here. And Verma shows it with this X, working X, Z, and PT. Uh, PT here, um, ignore, I think, for a second. Uh, Mainly, uh, you can look at uh, the expert here dependence. So, as I argued before, you see it goes towards zero for, for smallish x and uh, it's large for large x. So, it's a valence quark property. Uh, for z, z is a, uh, I think we had it like in an earlier slide, it's a fraction of the energy of the fragmented quark my hadron takes away. And you see, as, as a typical, so it is rise for rising z because at higher z, you basically close that it's more likely that the quark actually goes out, you know, is uh, contained in your fermenting hadron. So if you look at this R2 string model, if the actual quark is, if you actually take this first pion that gets produced, 
to contain the property initially, not also this will carry more energy of the carbon uh, force you're sitting at higher than global because it takes. Um, so then you see it here for um, did it, um, things are different pion charges, but I don't see the as soon as pi plus and pi minus, or the other way around. Uh, okay, anyway, the point is you made it for pi plus pi minus, it says opposite equal sign, which tells you transversely will be opposite equal roughly in magnitude for u quark and e quark, and it's very, very consistent between compass, uh, compass and compass. So then uh, the dihedral commutation function, because it's a collinear one, um, can also measure, uh, can be done in, in, in uh, PP collision. So it's uh, um, the first star measurement, but the data ones are more precise. So idea is similar. Uh, so we have a transversely polarized proton and a scattered unpolarized one. And then the transversity distribution of the, the my polarized proton that tells me the probability with, with which this polarized, the core point out here is polarized, and then it can use the dihedral commutation function um, to uh, various uh, smooth modulation, which is then proportional to uh, transversity. So as you see, this here is measured with the inland mass of the of the hadron pair, which has some uh, relationship to the hadronization uh, model. Um, as we discussed earlier, um, the actual x dependence is, is difficult to access here, so you have to put it like a global fit. To extract anything from that. And then finally, I'm not sure if uh, Felix uh, discussed uh, this, um, but uh, so Prozen theory also allows us to use uh, jet observers. So um, again, we have PP, so you have a polarized um, um, uh, proton, uh, maybe exactly the same process that we have here, but instead of uh, just using a pion pair here, we can uh, take the jet. And then the, uh, can measure the Collins modulations inside uh, inside this jet. Uh, this has been done by the STAR experiment as well. Uh, it's a I guess an older preliminary plot. Um, a two different center of mass energies, um, which are you see here is fairly close together, which tells you the evolution is, is small, which is something that's going to see a little bit later on. Uh, but the point is that you have uh, again uh, the by minus are the open points and the pi plus are the close points you can see a significant signal this time with z which you can measure in that in a jet um, and again opposite, uh, opposite sign okay um so these are nice asymmetries but unlikely so when we look at the unpolarized distribution functions or illicit distribution functions those asymmetries were directly connected to the pds so here it's of course not the case, you know, because here um, I still have this unknown orientation function that is like the factor that tells me how these modulations are connected to the actual transversity. So we still need to measure these orientation functions to extract the transversity. So I will talk about this a little bit tomorrow. So for now, we just assume that that's like a given quantity, and I just show you the results of all of uh, uh, current um, global fits. So I tried to make the argument earlier that an interesting um, quantity to extract is a tensor charge. So we can do this compared to lattice. So it's like a little bit older plot, but generally a shown update, uh, but the general idea hasn't really uh, changed. So what we have here are three different, um, uh, three different um, extractions. That's actually the, uh, uh, Okay, so the main thing is so the lattice is in black here. Okay, so as I said, lattice points are, have are very high, highly precise. So the tensor charge is something that you can really test your understanding of your move down. You know, of course, points are very precise. And you can the tensor charge is lattice points are very precise. So the data points are still have a relatively high um, uh, uncertainty. So you have um, here the Collins effect of so a single hydron extraction. And I think the green one is the dihedral extraction, but for the argument here, it doesn't really matter. So the point I want to make is that uh, the data set has a larger uncertainty and it's um, significantly uh, shifted from the lattice. So that's like an interesting thing. You know? So even though, of course, uncertainties are still large, at this point, our measurements do not agree of my first principle uh, calculation. So that uh, 
um, changed a little bit if you uh, believe the local JDAP groups. Um, so they did something they call a global fit, and I explained it later on a little bit what it means. It also includes PP data on uh, single hadron um, AN data. But so this is basically what they get in the JAM 20 data global fit. So this shows you the transversity, so tender charge separately for U and, uh, and deep walk, and this is like the, the integral. And so if you look at the integral, you see, see again um, here the uh, the lattice um, data here with this uh, small uncertainty. And you see here, Rai Shibaketa is a dihedron one, uh, and Galesio and Kang. So these are um, single hadron, dihedron, so they inspection from data, so you need to shift. But now what they did is they included, um, which is, um, okay, so it's, uh, you know, I can show you what they, they include. So they, they, um, they include A in there, they can uh, interpret it into a three framework. And then they say their baby are consistent. It's still an offset, but within the uncertainty is consistent with the lattice results. I think it's still like an open question. Um, as it, we, you see this, we have to measure this a little more precisely, but at least the latest global fits, at least from one group, see some, uh, see some consistency. So here you have the, again, here, as you see here, the lattice results. Um, here are the, uh, there's two dimensional plots. This is a global fit from JAM. Um, and the CIDIS plus uh, CIA is basically this, um, uh, the inspections from, from data and the effect ones. Okay. So it's, uh, these are maybe now all the collinear distributions. So I want to come to the uh, TMDs. So one TMD we already encountered. So I want to make that, or I think I made this point. So one TMD encountered is, is in fact the columns from the patient one, you know, because I made the point that we only get this left right effect if we allow intrinsic transfer momentum in the final state. So if we integrate our intrinsic transfer momentum, the Collins function will vanish because I won't have a left right asymmetry if I don't measure, measure the transfer momentum. Okay, so this is an example of a transfer momentum dependent distribution function. And it gives you a general idea why we're interested in this TMDs because they give us a correlation between the spin and the intrinsic transfer momentum. So in the fermentation case, gives a correlation between the auto and fork and the hadrons in the final state. But in terms of the um, PDFs, if you look for where people are most interested in, it gives you a correlation between the transfer momentum of the quarks inside the proton with uh, the spin of the quark or the spin of the nucleus. So it gives you spin orbit correlation in some sense, and therefore some information about the structure. So the Collins fermentation function um, uh, has another feature, uh, namely it's uh, TOT. So um, the reason is that if you um, look at this, uh, this like spin, um, uh, these spin dependent asymmetries, we have the, uh, the the problem that if you uh, if you look at the left right asymmetry that's spin dependent, if you now uh, do time reversal, what happens is because the spin vector is a pseudo vector, it doesn't change the sign. But the momentum is a vector change of size. So these are T odd uh, uh, function, which is a true, a generally true for all transfer single spin, uh, spin asymmetries for the reason that I explained. Um, so this T odd feature, um, I mean, I, for details, you have to look up the reference in our review. Uh, <laughs> so this T oddness is a feature in general of transverse uh, single spin asymmetries. And what you can derive from that is that. Uh, the general uh, requirement to have a non vanishing, vanishing transfer single spin asymmetry that you measure is that you um, have somehow a illicit flip in your, um, um, in your uh, interaction and uh, you need a phase shift because if you look at the amplitude level, you maybe need an interference with the, uh, the imaginary term, otherwise, the T odd, um, maybe this T odd part of the wave function uh, goes away. So the general feature of looking at transfer signal spin asymmetry is that you access QCD on the amplitude level because inherently all transfer um, signal spin observables are related to um, the interference effects on the QCD amplitude level. So naively you saw it with the, the Collins fermentation function where you have this interference between its different elasticity states, but that is like a general, that's the general feature of all transfer signal spin asymmetries. 
Okay, so uh, if we now go from this team these in the commentation section factor to the team these for the pattern distribution functions, actually it has like a very known and uh, somewhat interesting history that you might be aware of. So uh, transfer single scalar symmetries were observed like a long time ago, um, in fact, in the polar polar collisions. And the first explanation came from Collins based on these uh, commutation functions. And so the main bone of contention was this uh, naive TOT feature. Because if you have a fermentation function, you can easily convince yourself that it's possible because you don't look at the complete finite state. Um, so you can make yourself convince yourself that it's actually possible. But there's also was uh, a long, uh, early suggestion by Sivers that that also should be uh, able on the possible on the part distribution level. So this was contested by Collins uh, later on due to this TOT feature that they can't have TOT uh, PDFs, it's, it's, it's not allowed by symmetry arguments. Um, but it was uh, later universally accepted. And one big part of that is that there's this paper, Wolski and Schmidt, Schmidt, which showed that um, final state interactions, so when the cork gets hit and goes out and uh, interacts kind of with the remnant, so you may be traversing one from here. So these uh, microscopic final state interaction can lead to a uh, phase shift of the weight function that then can lead to this interference effects that you need to get this naive uh, to your office. Um, and so then it was universally uh, accepted. And in fact, these final state interactions, as I said, so for this transfer single spin symmetries, you need this naive pureness. That is something that means you have to have this phase shift and this interference, which you need, which means that they're always, you know, connected, these TOT effects always connected to some sort of final state dual interaction, um, which then has other interesting effects that you can test. So what you maybe um, um, are familiar with is that, um, ah, so, okay, so first, uh, uh, what I want to uh, make points of. So you have, in order to make, you know, have a non vanishing effect, you have to have this dual interaction here. So where does it come from? So if you go back to our core core correlator that we introduced yesterday, if you look at the core core correlator, um, I made the argument that you have to be, um, uh, you probe two quark fields of your protons. So they're separated by, you know, a light like distance if you are looking at, at PFs. So between the first and the second quark field, you have the chance of, to, uh, of interaction in the background one field of the proton, which you in principle have to uh, express here by uh, putting in this gauge link, which, uh, um, you know, describes the interaction with the If we are, if you look at collinear PFs, you can always choose a gauge where that becomes unity. Um, so for the TMDs, that's not you know that clear anymore because it turns out that it depends on the actual process um, what kind of shape this gauge link uh, takes. And uh, a famous uh, example is in fact the Sivas effect, which depends is, it becomes process dependent. So if you probe in Sidis or in Ray Young, we have either initial or final state interaction. Um, the sign of the state gauge link changes, and so you get the symmetries that are predicted to have an opposite sign. So you, uh, which is you know, a basic prediction of uh, you know from the gauge structure of PTD. So that's another thing. So as soon as you introduce these like TMDs, you open a whole other kind of can of worms, which allows you to probe PTD on the amplitude level and to get just more sensitive to a host of you know really exciting. Uh, uh, you know, effective effects. Okay, that's uh, second companies uh, second as well. But you probably you might have heard about this. Who has heard about like the Silver's sign change challenge? Raise of hands, nobody? One person. <laughs> Same person heard about transversity, I think, <laughs> I'm sure. Okay, well, then uh, you learn something new, which is, of course, exciting. Uh, I'll talk about this a little bit. But this was just to give you an idea. So, the testing the sign, the post dependent sign of the Sivas function is one of the kind of like the priorities of the nuclear physics uh, program or has been for a long time. Um, then there was this question okay, how do we access uh, angular momentum? And my answer is okay, you can do it uh, if you look at TMDs, there's like a more dependent connection. 
And so one of this uh, model dependent connection is, is shown here. Uh, it's again um, kind of like a model uh, that um, uh, that connects. Um, right, it, it, it's a model that explains to you uh, how you get the, uh, the transverse uh, signal spinner symmetries, and it does it by connecting uh, Sibos with uh, homolang momentum. And so the name is uh, uh, was introduced by Burkhardt uh, some, some time ago. It's called homodynamic lensing. And so here the idea is that. Um, how do you get these uh, different, um, you know, these, these, these different uh, left right symmetries? So, if you start with orbital and momentum of the quarks, yeah, so you, you have you polarize your, your proton, so the spin comes out here, say, so you have orbital and momentum of the quarks. So, depending on the, uh, you know, so the charge of the quarks or whatever, it goes, you know, around here. Um, now, what happens is that if you um, Look on the left side or the right side, these quarks will come either towards you or they go away from you yeah, because it goes, goes around. So you see like a relative shift in the momentum of the quarks. So if you ask for the left right asymmetry as if it's a fixed momentum x, that will shift if you're on the left side or the right side just because the final distribution function does keep you falling off. No? So if you shift the final distribution on the left side up and on the right side down, the net effect will be that there will be a difference in probability of hitting your uh, basically your particles on the left side or the right side. So that's the idea here. So if you combine that then with this final state, um, just the different probabilities of finding your quark on the left or the right side of the of the of the nucleon, and you combine them with this final state interaction, which is attractive, you basically um, uh, translate this orbital angle momentum into a left-right symmetry in the final state. I don't have the results here, but there are some model calculations which then gives you uh, some orbital angle momentum from the measure. So that's the fact. So people are really frowning on that because, as I said, it's, it's, it's model dependent. Um, so there's no direct connection. So if you look just on the operator level, there's no direct connection between the Silver's effect and, uh, um, and orbital angle momentum. So you have to make some uh, sort of model assumptions when those are uh, connected. Okay. So this is a Sibos function. So we just discussed this a little bit uh, in detail because it exhibits, um, you know, a lot of these interesting features that we generally have for um, TMDs. Um, so it uh, gives you uh, a first glimpse at the three-dimensional picture of the nucleon. So of course, what we want here at the end is the impact parameter and the uh, transverse momentum dependence. So the TMDs gives you one of these um, dimensions, or so like or three, it gives you the X and then the KT. Is still uh, missing the T here, but um, independent of that, it gives you a lot of um, ways, um, you know, to test your understanding of QCD, uh, either by comparing with that calculations, uh, looking at uh, the gauge structure of, of, of QCD, um, or general QCD in the appearance uh, level. Okay. So, of course, uh, the Silver's function is not the only TMD that you can get. And the reason is that uh, once you allow additional transverse momentum, of course, you get a much richer structure of the quark work correlation matrix uh, in lastly in this terms. So, when we introduced the quark work correlation matrix uh, yesterday, I basically made a point of expanding it uh, in the vector that we had available at the time. So, if you don't have transverse momentum at your, uh, at your disposal, the baby left with you know, a no true momentum, maybe a spin or so on. So they're only very limited terms. And these are then giving you just these three really interesting gaps. If you now start also introducing transverse uh, momentum, you get many more terms that you can build and that correspond then, of course, to more, uh, um, more um, the coefficients, which uh, you know, all corresponds to PDFs that you can measure and all have a uh, platonic interpretation. So this is here, as a, um, similar to uh, the beginning. So this is just um, kind of like the Dirac, this kind of Dirac structure um, notation. So it becomes a little bit clear, and you find this in our uh, review if you just uh, write it in terms of um, direct correlations of the available uh, vectors, and it gives you kind of like the interpretation of um, uh, of the. Um, uh, functions uh, that are in here. So, unfortunately, here there's like a little bit different notation used when it comes to TMDs, uh, like tons of different notations. But in principle, this is relatively clear and all because you have this delta, which means uh, polarized, and it gives you kind of the quark polarization and the nuclear polarization. So, for example, um, 
uh, if you look at the uh, Sivers effect here, so we have unpolarized quarks and transversely polarized uh, nucleon. You see that it's connected uh, to the uh, transverse momentum uh, of the quarks that move. So their correlations with the spin of the planet. Uh, yeah, so it's 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 uh, Sivers. Um, yeah, and then uh, so I have another slide with like a more kind of popular table interpretation of these other TMDs. But I just want to show you where this comes from. Now. So maybe if you just expand this for for correlation metrics in the vector city available, you basically get all these structures and these kind of correlations and you know, that tells you what you what you actually measure. Um, yeah. Uh, so if you want to, of course, this doesn't have the Collins commutation function because we're just looking at the TMDs in the in the nucleon. Um, here, I just want to mention that uh, if you look for the Collins effect. That is uh, will be equivalently um, contained into the in the fermentation matrix, which has a similar structure here, which we're going to discuss in the next uh, lecture. lecture. Okay, uh, I think we already, already um, well, actually we already saw how to measure this. Um, yeah, I guess we already talked about this, but in in general, um, yes, I just want to uh, mention one kind of like uh, small. Um, uh, kind of like issue that you might uh, think about. Um, so uh, in order to for to measure, you see, of course, that the Sivers effect, and we kind of already talk about how to measure it, but like if you didn't know it yet, you would wonder the following, because this here shows you the correlation of the intrinsic transverse momentum of the quarks with the spin. You know? So of course, I know how to measure the spin of the proton and the momentum of the proton, but how do I get the intrinsic transverse momentum of the quarks? You know? Of course, um, the only thing I can measure in the end is the sum of uh, basically the transverse momentum of the hadrons that come out. So um, at the very least, I have a second scale. Um, so in addition to the Q square as my hard scale, I also have a, a transverse momentum, which is like a lower scale. That's the one problem. But the other problem is also that this transverse momentum can, can, can come either from the intrinsic quark transverse momentum or other Collins effect, you know, or also unpolarized permutation comes from the hadronization. You know? So if I measure the final state hadron transverse momentum, I never know if it comes from the fermentation or from the, uh, from the uh, intrinsic transverse momentum. So that should then direct me to the, to the question, so how do I differentiate between Collins effect and Sivers effect? Of course, both are in some sense left-right asymmetries um, that are depending on the uh, quark, uh, the proton transverse, um, uh, transverse uh, spin. So, what comes to your rescue is uh, naively there are different angular dependencies, but why is this? And the reason is uh, because the uh, Sivers effect is dependent on the initial quarks, uh, whereas the uh, Collins effect is very dependent on the outgoing quark spin. So what happens once you hit your the quark with your photon and the, uh, the quark goes out, it flips its its polarization, which then leads to this. Um, uh, different angular dependence. So I said um, when I introduced the quantum commutation function, I showed you the sine dependence, you know, but then Thomas measured this cosine dependence. And that's basically related to that. Also, the, uh, the commutation function is depending on the, on the, on the sine of this as a moodle angle, um, looking at the outgoing quark polarization, but the outgoing quark polarization is related to the parent nuclear polarization by. Um, uh, by a flip due to the absorption of the spin one of the photons. It's just kind of like a side, sidebar, just in case you think about this tonight and like wonder how it comes. Okay. In any case, so um, for both these cases that you saw, we measure this as multiple correlations of the hadrons in the final state, and then they have these different uh, angular dependencies. Unfortunately, uh, yeah, um, unfortunately. So if I expand my whole uh, cross section, and ask about all if, if I allow transverse momentum and ask for all uh, as a uh, correlations, I get this whole uh, zoo here, which I it's a slide from Alexei Bukuri showed at, at, at some time. Um, so these are all the structure functions that, uh, that then exist. Um, but what we're usually looking at is um, the interpretation of those uh, in the pattern model. Um, so it's shown here. So these are the same structure functions as written in terms of PFs and permutation functions. You see here you see the the distribution functions, um, including the TMDs, uh, and 
these are all the functions that pose the sequence with all the correlations. So also you have the unpolarized one F, then you have uh, four molders, which gives the, the transverse polarization of quarks and unpolarized uh, photons, which is only allowed when, when, you, when you allow transverse momentum, otherwise it's, that's, that's not allowed. Then you have uh, things like uh, Jeff Exotic, of course, it's just let's go to the known one, Bo Mulders, Transversity, Sivers. And then we have something with like, uh, kind of like um, more exotic names, worm gear, pretzelocity. Um, so for worm gear, people often use uh, the name with this uh, transversely polarized quarks and longitudinal polarized protons. So you kind of have this kind of opposite polarizations. And this pretzelocity name comes from the fact, I think uh, people don't really like this name anymore, but um, there are like early model calculations which um, look uh, um, at uh, in certain quark models how the wave function would look like uh, if quarks have a specific polarization. And it just turns out that for pretzelocity, it looks like a, like a pretzel. Um, yeah, I'm not sure how much uh, I uh, to that. Um, so the other thing I want to make that uh, point what makes so everything that goes to the transverse spin age is uh, carried out the same as, as, as transversity. So you see it couples here to the polarized transverse polarization dependent uh, fermentation function. Uh, and of course, uh, most of those uh, that are sensitive to a specific uh, the quark polarization, specifically the polarized nucleon, are uh, depending on the quark, on the, on the target polarization, and something like the worm gears uh, depending on target and uh, quark polarization. Uh, right. So these are the chiral odd ones. So essentially, all the ones that here named with, with H that they meet this polarized. Uh, fermentation function here. So what you often see is then uh, the arrangement in this matrix as we had before. Um, so when we uh, last, most of the lectures so far, we talked about the diagonal one, which are the collinear one, F, G, and H. Now, if we allow this transverse momentum, we get these um, other functions um, here. Uh, here, for example, we have um, um, the, the Silvers effect. Um, and uh, the various warm gear ones and so on. Um, um, yeah, so what I want to say. Uh, so um, if you assume a certain uh, spin polarization, since they're, uh, this, they, they give you the transverse momentum inside the proton, they can be associated with um, you know, dipole distribution or even a quarterfold distribution here, which just tells you uh, if you polarize your uh, proton in a certain way. Like how the quark wave function should be uh, evolving and uh, correlate with that. Okay. Ah, okay. So because we uh, we talked about the Collins effect uh, already, um, it's talk about the Silvers effect. As I said, the measurement is, is basically the same thing. You just uh, extract a different a smoother correlation of the phi state head on here, uh, phi h minus phi s. Uh, it's a similar measurement as, as Collins. Um, so again, you see it's mainly, uh, it's from a Hermes experiment, it's mainly a, C, uh, a valence for property. So you're at high X, you have a large uh, signal against the Y is a little bit of Z, but you see certainly a very significant signal uh, for pi plus and uh, for pi minus not so much. And for zero also not so much for minus. Okay, questions so far? No? Okay, all clear. So let's move on. Um, so I already um, mentioned that uh, a consequence of allowing, looking at part of distribution functions, which um, um, allow um, effects, or may you have to take into account the effects of the interaction of gluons in the field uh, while you move through the photon is that uh, you now introduce a certain uh, process dependence. So it goes under the name of modified universality. So in principle, universality is one of these holy principles if you do nuclear structure, no? because if you measure something, universality means that the part of the distribution function are the same or processes they measure that, that allows you to measure hundred million different processes, put them all in the same global fit and extract the PDFs. If the PDF is process dependent, then you can forget about that now because if it's like you know a different thing that you measure in every process, it doesn't work anymore. Uh, so fortunately for the TMDs, the modification in your cells is usually takes a very simple form. And then one example is the Sivers effect. So as I said, 
our typical approach to Sivers effect is um, is in Sivers uh, reactions. So this is a handbag diagram here. So you have the interference of um, something like this, where you find a state interaction with one uh, diagram, as you see on the right side. And the key feature is um, if you look at the color structure here. Um, it turns out that this gluon interaction here in the final state is attractive. You compare it now to very young, where you um, produce, uh, you know, a virtual proton going to electrons. There's no color charge in the final state. You only have color charge in the initial state. Um, that uh, color structure is different, and it turns out that that interaction is repulsive. So this is the um, fundamental prediction rooted in uh, quantum field theory, namely that if you measure a Sivers effect in Sidis and you are young, you have the opposite sign. If it doesn't have the opposite sign, you don't understand anything about QCD. So obviously it's something that you want to test. Um, so there's like a semi-classical picture, which is kind of nice. Uh, so it's actually uh, here a similar to that table lecture here. So we showed this uh, some years ago. Uh, the work on this effect, I think, for lower X, Gary Koshkov. So one thing, you can see in a semi classical picture again if you have quarks kind of like spin kind of like replaces by a rotating charge. So it's again this effect if you are in front of the proton, so you have initial state interaction in some sense. Um, the motion is in this direction, so uh, the scattering goes in that way. But if you have um, an interaction which uh, takes more likely place kind of in the back of the proton, it goes in the other direction. So which correspond to a final state of the action and it goes in the other direction. So um, as I said, this um, measurement is uh, kind of like a fundamental prediction of QCD. So there was a lot of effort in several experiments in order to test this. Uh, one dedicated experiment was a compass to a young program. So I introduced compass earlier as a generalized SIDF experiment. But then there, uh, because they take the beam from the SPS, so they have a proton beam and produce uh, muons in the secondary reaction, the same way they can also produce pions and have a hydron beam. And that's, what they, that's what they did. So they have a polarized target and shoot a pion beam on this. Um, and as we saw, uh, basically, if you um, have a pion beam and a, a proton target, you're sensitive to the balance quarks in your, in your target, or because you can pick out the, the C quarks in the, in the, in the, in the pion. Um, so you can you know, measure um, the Sivers effect in, in uh, yeah. Here, uh, that's a plot for the compass experiment in which region they the measure. So here's the mass of the, uh, of the muon pair. And as I said earlier, and also this is like shows you the general big problem. Of, certainly if you do spin and very young uh, physics, you are severely statistics limited, no? Because the very young spectrum drops off exponentially to high uh, muon masses. Uh, but then here in this uh, region, you have low statistics. There's a James High peak, which basically means you can't like it's difficult. You uh, you know you've drowned the drowning the very uh, system signal. So you basically have to concentrate in this like very high mass region where your statistics are very you know, very high. That's something that we see in a second. But anyways, so, so Compass did this measurement for some reason. <laughs> it's kind of funny. So that doesn't show up like this in my uh, my laptop. Uh, they like rotated. But, yeah, but some of it, but anyways, this is the same. So this is just in the update. So the latest and greatest result preliminary showed actually at Duke and uh, just a couple months ago. Uh, this is a compass point. And you see here the, the, the theory predictions uh, with the sign flip and without the sign flip. And you see, unfortunately, I mean, the compass. Uh, Sivers points, I only have the one point each of these problems that I mentioned is consistent with um, with a sign flip, uh, but with a large and large uncertainties here. So the story is maybe not really over, but there's a certain strong indication that the sign flips actually uh, observed. And so what you measure here is again an absolute modulation, uh, but this time the absolute modulation is basically by the, uh, the electron pair um, uh, secure. Um, uh, sit yourself in like the um, in this uh, in the target frame, you can measure the smooth relation of the uh, produced depth of pair uh, around uh, the scattering uh, plane, and that's, that's what you measure in this case. So, I made earlier this point as if the equivalency of or like or the similarity between real and uh, uh, W and Z production. 
So you can do something very similar with Ws and star. So you can look at single spinner symmetry of transversely polarized protons. And now you look at this full emulation of the W boson with respect um, to the scattering plane. So it's been uh, done here. So it's a little bit more complicated measurement because you uh, have to uh, reconstruct the direction of the W from the hadronic recoil here to get an actual uh, solution direction. So it's a little bit more involved, but it's possible. So Star did this measurement. I'm not sure, probably, probably private, but they did a preliminary measurement that seemed to be indicating what a strong indication for a sign change with large uncertainties. So very recently, they updated that measurement, which has small uncertainties, but the, the symmetries also went down a little bit. So you see here the, uh, the projections uh, with a sign change. And uh, I mean, the star points are consistent with that, but um, you know, they're also consistent with zero, so they don't tell you that much yet. And one reason is that um, these are metropolitan results, so you're kind of like sitting um, at relatively low x, and you, know, you want to push it to make a forward direction here, where the symmetries, the civil symmetry is supposed to be larger. So there's an update upgrade of the detector on the works that uh, extends except uh, the acceptance there. Uh, so hopefully, it's something, it's something more. So, um, okay, that's the last thing. So this thing. So we do kind of shuttle that to Mars. I will say 10 minutes. And that's okay. Then we will launch with the five minutes ah, before. Okay. Um, one thing I wanted to mention just uh, in case you come across it. So there's another complication that happens if I start uh, accepting transmission and everything becomes more complicated. <laughs> But uh, one uh, big complication is also uh, when it comes to evolution. So if you saw yesterday in the unpolarized case, if I want to evolve from one scale to the other, because uh, Q square, I can use deep uh, equations. No? So it's easy, people have been calculating it to, I don't know what, what, what order, so it's, it's very, very accepted. So the problem, if I have team E evolution now, I have two scales. So I have the Q square scale and I have the KT scale. So I have to, um, do basically an evolution uh, in, in these two scales, which is uh, more uh, uh, complex and uh, too complex for me to explain A because next one this and B uh, because it takes more than one slide. Um, but the point I want to make is that um, um, a, a big uh, a feature of this TMD evolution is that you uh, can generate the transverse momentum. Um, at highest, uh, if you want to generate uh, a lot of transverse momentum, you can do the perturbability. So that's something you actually have in a perturbative control uh, and can uh, calculate. But if you uh, want to generate just a little bit of transverse momentum, this is something that's like a, a non perturbative feature of QCD. So if you look at um, the evolution in, uh, for TMDs, so here in the impact parameter space, it has this typical structure that you have a, play, a space that does it's a collinear piece that goes like a D lab equation, and you have a piece that generates the perturbative transverse momentum, which is just the Lewin radiation, but then it has this non perturbative part. And so this is like a curse and a blessing. So the curse is um, unlike D lab, you can't just uh, calculate that and um, you know, use it for evolution. Uh, but the blessing is that's uh, universal. So if you measure it in one process, you can use it for all the others. Um, and um, it has by now, people have been looking at this kernel and it has some interesting interpretations in terms of uh, uh, the structure of the QCD vacuum. Um, so if you look at um, the PT spectrum, for example, in the Z production here, um, uh, if you um, approach this just with a perturbative uh, QCD evolution, you realize you can describe the PT spectrum for the high PT because you uh, do this perturbatively, but you would fail spectacularly with the low PT, where this uh, they would really need this TMD um, approach in the evolution. Um, yeah. So I just want to mention this because it's kind of TMD evolution is, um, you know, depending on the community goes, like a, it's a big topic. Okay, so let me. Uh, give you some idea about PP physics in the last 10 minutes. Um, and I just kind of want to, uh, I think here at Jefferson Lab, it's something that you probably don't hear that often about, but it's like a whole another world out there. So um, I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, so as I hear this saying, so SID is not the only game in town, as we also have protocol equivalence. 
So we already saw a lot about this when you look at the longitudinal structure. But in fact, historically, uh, even if you look at transfer spin physics, PP was actually the first time that we saw really large transfer spin effects. So there are two uh, measurements you often see cited as a motivation for transfer spin physics. The one is the observation of uh, transverse lambda polarization, which I don't think we have uh, time to talk about. Uh, but the other one is this really surprising uh, transverse single spinner symmetries of pions if you, if you polarize. Uh, so you have single spinner symmetry. So you, uh, it's maybe shown here. So you polarize one proton transversely, you hit it with another proton, and you measure the left right asymmetries, just the left right asymmetry. So there's no um, second scale or anything involved. And you see this ginormous asymmetry. So, so previously, if you remember Silvers and so on, you saw a couple of percent, no? So this is 30%, no? Yeah, so it's, it's, it's huge. So why, why is this, no? So this is something people were looking at for 40 years, and just now we start to understand how this, this, this comes about. But it was, uh, as I said, it's so striking that, uh, of course, uh, it, it generated a lot of interest. Um, so here is protocol is XF, which we saw earlier, which is in this case roughly, uh, you know, has a relationship with the uh, polarized proton uh, X because you go in the forward direction. So here you have uh, C fox and low X. So the difference is almost the same as. Uh, 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 so actually here I have the, uh, these are the lambda results, but okay, we don't need to really focus too much. Uh, so it was in particular interesting because uh, I mean, it's also ancient history. Maybe it just means that I've you know, been around for too long. But you always, if people show these plots, you always say, oh, it was so surprising because there's this old king pumping Repco paper that says that uh, this should be zero because you, you know, it's not a TMD, which was something known that. But if you do this in production QCD, um, as I said, due to the spin flip, this should be highly suppressed, especially at these energies. Also, it's like 200 GeV, uh, so it's very high energy. So it should be gone if you, if you, uh, if you go to uh, just to put it to CD. So, um, as I said, this is not a TMD observable for several reasons. I mean, the, the main reason is you have only one scale. You, know, you, can, you have only one proton to measure. So, you have one scale, which is the KP. So, you completely can't apply the KP framework. But it didn't stop people to do it. So, there's uh, something called a generalized pattern model that did this. Um, the problem is if you apply the TMD framework, is you run another uh, uh, problem that's unique to PP. So unlike CIDIS, as we saw in Duellian, PP has, um, you know, you have two, your probe also has a color charge. So in Duellian, that problem wasn't really that big because you had maybe two color charge initial state, but then you didn't have anything in the final state where you could use uh, electrons. But if you have PP to hadrons, you have color charge in the initial state and the final state. So what can happen is you can wisely exchange gluon between initial and final state, which correlates everything. And that uh, was then shown by Rogers and, uh, and Mulders uh, some time ago, that that's, that maybe means that you cannot have a generalized TBD factorization model. So you can't separate the EFs and the computation functions. So you have no universality anymore, and you have, it might be it's very complicated how these guys are, are, are factorized. So of course, Every downside has an upside, so you know, like if you have lemons, make lemonade. So, it also means, of course, you have potentially new effects due to color entanglement. And that's like people start looking for this. I can talk about this uh, if you have interest in that. But in any case, so it basically means that you can't really treat this in a team TV framework uh, consistently. Um, yeah, so yeah, you can't learn everything from electrons or from color probe gives uh, new effects that you can't. Uh, so um, the caveat here is uh, for some time, people were not really sure if I do jet physics in, in um, PP, which is shown as we use a coins commutation function in TMD, if that's actually affected by this and it's shown that that works. So I think Felix might have uh, talked about this. And also uh, W and Z and gamma production works because you don't have color charge in the final state. So, okay, so how do we get these, um, I guess we have to go very really quick through the next couple of slides. So how do you get these asymmetries now? So you have to stay in a collinear picture. So how do you then generate these, uh, the same effect? So what you do is you have to go to subleading twist, twist three. Uh, so as we see uh, earlier, so subleading twist always means you have an additional blue and field in the game that interacts with your, with, with your quarks. So if you write down the handbag, that looks very suspiciously 
like uh, the TMD picture. So you have an initial gluon correlation that uh, gluon field that allows you to um, interact here. So the difference with the with the TMD uh, pictures in some sense that for the uh, um, for the TMD picture you have this uh, interaction this at stage link, whereas for the um, for the twist three functions may be an explicit gluon field uh, into a four four correlator. So here's um, the example um, of this twist three uh, matrix element which were first proposed to uh, explain this uh, single transfer spin asymmetry. You see here the fork fields and you see an additional gluon fields. So you measure basically the correlation of the forks with the gluon fields in the proton. So it's often interpreted as okay, you have a fork that gets knocked out and then you measure the force that the gluon field and proton has on a same transversely polarized fork in, in, in the proton. Um, so it turns out that this specific um, uh, matrix element, which is called uh, Schusterman, uh, matrix element is not cannot explain these full asymmetries. It turns out you also have to have just three fermentation functions, um, and together with those, uh, you can describe this uh, transverse single spin asymmetries. Um, ah, okay, so the other thing, uh, the suspicious similarity is also then expressed in this uh, semi famous relationship. I mean, if, if you integrate the Sivers function over KT. You end up with this uh, true Sturman matrix element. Uh, if you, and this has two arguments here because you have the X of the gluon at the, the four fields, but if you do it basically in this diagonal place, you, uh, you get uh, this, uh, basically the same, uh, this, this relationship here. So um, this is kind of all, so the relationship between some true three, this integral relationship to the TMDs, then allows you to put it in the same fit. So you have just three fermentation functions as well. Some of those are connected uh, to uh, Collins and transversity. So you can basically put everything in a global fit that uh, allows for these just three functions and um, uh, has the team in there as well. So you can put in the PP data and the CIDIS data. And this is basically what has been done in a global fit that I showed that uh, actually is consistent with the, with the lattice data. So using this global fit, um, you can, yeah, you're, Able to describe this AN data very well. So, this is the Brahms data. It's an experiment that Rick has defined since now. So, it's showing um, ion production, pine AN uh, for positive and negative pions, plus PT, uh, same as star forward uh, pi zeros. Um, and so, that's the pure description. So, I think it's still, even though it works all very well, and I think most people are convinced, I think, but there was still for a long time a lot of skepticism because as you see here, I explained to you a long time before that, oh, yeah, twist three, one working definition that it drops with PT, but here obviously it doesn't drop with PT, uh, even though it's a higher twist function. So there's like some uh, other kinematic dependencies in this in these uh, amplitudes that it's like uh, you know transitive with higher twist, which then leads to this observable symmetries. Uh, and then, okay, I think that's my last slide where I talk about GPDs uh, tomorrow. Um, I just want to kind of, as kind of like an appetizer, um, this uh, twist threes also have some interest at, at Jefferson Lab. So if you allow for twist three for, um, uh, PDFs at the collinear level um, accessible in CIDIS, so this unfortunately this true sermon element is not accessible in CIDIS, but in CIDIS you, you can get these um, other guys here, it's GT, EDF, HL, they all have some probabilistic interpretation which have to do with the fork propagating the gluon field, for example, E of uh, X is uh, 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 transverse force exerted by the color field on transverse polarized uh, quark after scattering and polarized nucleon. Quite a mouthful, but the point is to basically uh, measure, uh, you know, if something has to do with the gluon field strength inside the proton. So it's something that we recently measured at the, at the class experiment. Uh, so in dihadron uh, correlations, uh, we see, we see uh, quite significant uh, Symmetries uh, and this EFX was uh, extracted from that uh, just also this year. Yeah. So, this is um, all I have, I think, for today. Uh, tomorrow, so we're kind of in this uh, picture of the final distribution of the zoos. So we talk about uh, form factors and PDFs and TMDs and uh, talk a little bit more about GCPs and a little bit about fermentation function. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much for. Uh, Lecture. Okay, we'll the next slide. Uh, so, question. Question. Uh, any question now?
Okay, so I have a question. <laughs> so I'm, this is a very naive question because I'm not an expert in this and I'm a few. So let's suppose that we can measure final state polarization. Yes, that you can. And you mean in polarized state, yeah? But so do you think that we we'll have to, to describe that a bit? I mean, does the structure function in there? Yeah, so I mean, I know, I know that it's a hard, I mean, it's hard to measure. Right, right. So, so the thing is, what experiments are doing is so the the main so we have all kinds of beautiful channel channels that are super clean and nice, but we don't have this. this is, that's kind of what it comes with. So you can measure final state polarization mainly in Palmer production. Yeah? So you can also measure it in rows, but uh, rows has been once and it becomes more complicated. So you have tender polarization, everything becomes more complicated. So the most obvious thing to do is lambda. And the ESC, uh, as you uh, can point to the okay, will have probably a beautiful lambda problem. But so far, numbers have been very difficult um, for uh, several reasons. A, um, they're just, so pions are just, you know, you have just a lot of pions, so you can measure a lot of good M, and you can make uh, the net bigger. Clean lambdas A are more difficult to, to uh, reconstruct. Uh, due to the high mass, you have less of them, uh, and they suffer, which people uh, usually completely ignore, uh, which I find uh, infuriating, uh, um, from a feed down. So you get a ton of lambda from the case of sigmas, and you can do more higher energy for other stuff. So if you measure a lambda, Less than fifty percent of them come actually from the main form. But in principle, yes, you can do. And, and lambdas have been of interest for a long time. There are tons of papers, uh, and uh, they maybe I'm not sure if I come to it uh, tomorrow. But they also have this really nice feature um, that you uh, you have this um, you have this uh, correspondence between PDFs and commutation functions. So if you measure a commutation function that flows from an unpolarized quark and a polarized lambda that's basically equivalent of the Silver's PDF, so you can ask similar questions about the statistics and so on. And so the other point I want to make, the dihedron commutation function, which I hopefully maybe also have time to talk about tomorrow, is something similar. You don't have polarization in the final state per se, but your system has overlying momentum, which is it kind of serves a similar role. You just have different quantum numbers because you have overlying momentum of spin and it has, uh, but it has advantage you can have an arbitrary polarization in the final state because spin goes higher and higher over the states. But yeah, there's, there's um, yeah, the quantum work of, uh, as we published recently, um, as I said, some uh, paper about uh, lambda physics at ESC. So that's, I think, the first time that we have that the citizen experiment has enough energy we can have, you know, lambdas produced at high, high. Uh, statistics and uh, precise. So previously, you know, Herbis had a lambda program, Compass had a lambda program, Class had a lambda program, but it's all, yeah, you get like one point in error bar signal. Right? Yeah, you know, okay. Right. Thank you. Okay, so all the questions are answered. Thank you. Oh, right. So, uh, yeah, so I had it yesterday and I think I just had too much material. It was, uh, um, I'm not sure if I see. So, I had yesterday the slide, twist three is complicated. <laughs> so, uh, twist three, so by now, people say naively, twist three is everything that's, that's suppressed with the field. Yeah, this is a hard scale. So, that's all this twist three. Originally, uh, it meant it was connected to uh, the operator current expansion. So if you uh, expand your hydraulic tensors in terms of quantum field operators, which in some sense you do if you write as PDFs, because you can write PDFs in terms of these uh, characteristic form fields. So, um, so you can write a formal definition in terms of the dimension of the spin of these operators and you can also do suppression. For me, so the theorist. I bet what you <laughs> what, what is the of um, So for me, the interesting thing, what we call, so twist three, the suppression can come due to different effects. The effects that come um, uh, due to um, some kinematic effect, but what we call pure twist three is always something where we have quark 
blue one for correlations. You know? So if you look at the, if you write in the, in the shape of the core four correlator that I had here somewhere, I can show sure it somewhere. I have for the Silver's function also. But it's, it's a very, I mean, it's a, it's a simple question, but it's, uh, I think if you, uh, if you ask uh, 10 theorists, you get 20 different answers, uh, and it's like a very com complex topic. But um, my naive take on it, where's, the, where's my, my core core formula? Oh. You look up the slide where I had the. Oh, maybe I just show it. Okay, let's go just to the just the distinction function which I had. Okay. Here. So if I write uh, my cross section in terms of these four four coordinates, so um, as I showed yesterday, if I have a I put my core fields on the light pole. Yeah, it's like a, a small thing. Um, so if I have a, um, just two core fields here, yeah, that basically corresponds to PF because that gives me this uh, this uh, probabilistic interpretation. Also, I have the handbag diagram, one core uh, on that one side, one core on the other side, and then I can uh, maybe uh, write you know two uh, bar Q and it gives me this uh, you know efficient point of here. I insert explicitly another blue one here. Yeah. So this corresponds to this additional blue one back here. So if you see a twist free handbag diagram, they always have some sort of blue one here. Yeah. So for Q twist three, if you look at the core layer, they have like an additional uh, blue one field here. Um, so this is kind of like the quantum field theoretical uh, explanation. So do you agree with that? Or are you not listening to me? <laughs> I was not <doing> enough. <laughs> I was zoning out, but I agree. Okay, okay. that's both fine. Uh, but if you go, uh, if you just look for a simple um, interpretation, it's always something that's 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 suppressed to form of choose. Yeah. But the interesting thing, as I said, from a physics point of view, are these pure to three operators because they are then can interpret this this idea because the addition one field then can give you this like you know this false interpretation if you look at the Matthias Kogas papers. They may combine like a PDF to the PDF to the core, and we have this addition one field that leads to a force of this, this one. But it's a, I mean, I don't want to give you the impression that that is like a simple thing. You know? <laughs> like, um, like, you don't, you shouldn't feel like, oh, yeah, it's something, oh, it's, 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 I should like know that, right? It's, 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 it's super complex. Yeah. Okay. I don't see any other questions here. Yeah. So thank you again. So if you have questions or slides, because I mean I'm open to Slack or whatever, yeah. I'm happy to discuss thank you very much. everything. Okay, thank you very much.